right, everybody, welcome back to Sky Watchers Radio on Dark Matter Radio Network and, of course, PSN Radio. And I want to ask everybody to please have a nice sit down right now. If you're standing up, if you're running around, sit down, turn the radio up, listen in. We're going to have a lot of fun with our guest, Mr. Aaron Judkins, a.k.a. Maverick. He's an author, explorer, and an archaeologist. From Texas. Don't mess with Texas. He has a passion for searching for the truth about the mysteries of the past and exposing forbidden history. Aaron, this is way long overdue, but welcome to Sky Watchers Radio, my friend. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. It, you're right. It is way overdue. <laughs> and if, the, if your audience only knew how overdue it is, maybe we should tell them. If they had an inkling or an idea of how long I've been trying to have you on this show, it would probably drive a lot of them to send you hate mail. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we no. got a lot of defensive uh, fans of this show, Aaron. You just don't know. We call them the, the Squash Nuts, by the way. That's the name of our group, Squash Nuts. Love you guys. They get defensive, so I don't want to have them send you any hate mail. But this man right here has been eluding us like the president of the United States. But it is so much fun <laughs> to finally have you on the show. <laughs> I'm so glad to be on with you uh, on the show. You know, it's it's uh, it's quite odd that my schedule has been so uh, so erratic over the last six months. Um, and every time we try to sync our schedules up, it just doesn't work out and um and i've got a very narrow window in my schedule these days my um, area. and and it is uh uh you know it, it, and it really bothered me because i had the last time i talked to you i had to tell you i said i am not i'm not doing this on purpose <laughs> i promise i promise uh so anyway it's really great great to be on this show tonight with you and some of you listening might recognize the voice. You, of course, are a guest radio host for Epic Voyages Radio on uh, Inception Radio and, uh, of course, uh, plays here on Dark Matter Radio Network. That's right. It uh, plays right here on Dark Matter on Friday nights. Uh, Epic Voyages Radio, um, Friday nights on Dark Matter Radio Network. And, you know, it's been a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Um, I don't do radio full time. I, I do it, as you said, as a... As a guest host, I rotate through the uh, through that schedule about once a month. I go on the program, but I absolutely love it. It is so much fun. I get to do what you guys do all the time, mm. and um, I really have a blast doing it. It's it's a lot of fun, and I'm so glad for Keith um, for having us on the Dark Matter Radio Network. And um, you know, the audience has been uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and the listeners uh, have been very responsive uh, to the show, and I know to your show as well. And so I'm glad to, you know, get out and um, and and finally get on your program uh, tonight with you. So so what a what an honor. Now we're gonna talk about a lot of different things. Uh, one thing I definitely wanted to bring up is uh, your research in biblical uh, archaeology, which is uh, always something fascinating to me. And um, and we're going to talk about you know of course ufology. Don't worry about it. don't worry, folks. We're going to touch on ufology a lot. Uh, but I want to first uh, you know go into your background a little bit. And so for the, for the listeners who are not too familiar with your history, uh, give a brief description of what you've done in the past besides Epic Voyages. It's a great show, by the way. Oh well, thanks. Um, you know, wow, I I wear so many hats. Yes, you in, do in my life. <laughs> uh, you know, when people ask me what I do, I have to tell them, you know, what day is it? Because it depends on what day it is, is what I'm doing. Um, uh, you know, basically, I I started out with a real passion for just for history and archaeology and learning. And um, um, and I just love to go to museums. I love to, to just learn everything I could about ancient civilizations uh, Near Eastern archaeology, biblical archaeology, and I just, you know, the Native Americans here, America Southwest, I love it all. I mean, I do. I, I, I'll study it all. I don't know it all, but I love to study it all. <laughs> and, um, and, and because of that, that, you know, that led me to schedule my vacations around 
going to museums and going out, mm. you know, to sites and and things that you know um, were just a lot of learning fun uh, on on site, not from a book. Although I love books, I I, I do read quite a bit. I've probably read a thousand books in my life so far, and I've got um, a library full of books in my office. Um, but it's a different thing to go out into the field or just to go out and learn about those things. And and so for me, that that was just a tremendous thing to go do, but it was very limited for me. Um, and then my life kind of took a direction where I pursued a different field in the medical field for for many years um, and currently still do. Um, and that's why I say I wear many hats uh, because – I do so many different things, um, but the the medical field was something that kind of was my bread and butter. It always provided me, you know, the opportunity to kind of self fund myself and go out and do the things that I really was passionate about, and that was history and archaeology. And uh, I really give my grandparents credit for that because they were old rock hounds, and and you know. I really got an appreciation for just going out and looking for rocks and and uh that led into arrowheads and and you know so I had an early interest in my life about these things and uh you know when I was when I was about 16 I was out uh with a friend of mine we was on uh, a large ranch in the uh Texas panhandle and there was a huge cliff and there was a kind of a dry stream bed and we were walking through there and and I saw this huge bone laying on the ground. I ran over to it and I picked it up and it was huge. And I said, look at this bone. I pulled it out of the sand and it, um, the person that was with me said, "That I think that's a bison bone. I said, what? A buffalo? Are you saying buffalo bone? And, 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 and the, the thing was a huge buffalo bone. What we know is a is a bison bone. And my friend said, yeah, my dad, who was a foreman on that ranch, a cowboy foreman, said this is a cliff where the Indians used to run off the buffalo. And then they would, you know, they would, you know, uh, slaughter them. And, you know, they would use them to survive, for right. obviously for meat and for tool making. And they used everything on that thing. But here, right. was, yeah. here was a bone. And I pulled this bone up, and I was looking at it. And I turned around and Sticking out of the cliff was an occipital part of a skull. The oh, occipital wow. part is a back part of your skull, and it was a human skull. And I immediately dropped the bison femur that was in my hands, <laughs> and I'm staring at this, and I said, "Look at this thing! This is this is a skull. It's a human skull." And so I, was, you know, at 16, I'm looking for the nearest stick. I'm digging this thing out. You know, <laughs> this, this thing's going home with me. And um, my friend said, "No, we should leave it. We should go tell my dad." And so, in hindsight, that was great wisdom. Mm, um, and uh, and so we did. I I ended up dropping my stick and you know retreated in in defeat <laughs> um, <laughs> because I wanted that that skull. But turns out that was a very important find. Later, the archaeologist uh, from the university came out and documented a whole new find they didn't know was there, and it allowed the Native Americans to come huh. out and um, and and basically uh, confirm the site, and then, you know, of course, uh, they were able to, to make the final decision on what happened to it, and, they, and, uh, and you know, they, they, they gained a lot of important knowledge from that site, but they left the human bones where they were, and that's exactly what, you know, what they did, and that was the right, right. thing to do. Yeah. So, um, and I didn't know the end of that story for a long time uh, later on in life, but um, but that led into a lot of um, a lot of searching about what the mysteries of the past are. And when I began to go into the field and study formally and academically in archaeology, and then went out in the field, I realized that there was a lot of um, evidence, a lot of empirical evidence that wasn't matching up to what I had been taught, and that really. Uh, led me to question why had I never heard about some of these things? Why was it that 
I was learning about this for the first time in the basements uh, and, you know, of artifacts and, and, you know, people's homes and, hey, come over here. We found something over here. Check this out. Or have you heard about this? You know, hey, I've got something. Have you read about this? And I'm thinking, no, I haven't seen any of this. What is this stuff? And so, um, uh, you know, I think for the first time, it really, I think it really, the whole thing came to light when Michael Cremer wrote the book uh, and co-authored the book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology, blew the lid off the thing. And I'm thinking, whoa, I mean, it, it just, my mind, it blew my it mind. It all made right? sense. It just, it just clicked. It did, and yeah. and I'm thinking, this is what I'm seeing some of this stuff in my own research, and and so it really resonated with me. Why was this not being taught in mainstream archaeology? Why wasn't this being discussed? How come it was being tabled hmm. and and um and and ignored in in the realms of academia? And after you know, some um, inquiry into into some of these questions in the realms of academia, I realized very quickly that they have no interest in it. And I was basically told, leave it alone. Um, and I ran into stories of people, of geologists, of good scientists uh, who came across things that just simply – cut against the grain of, of everything that we know. And they've had their careers destroyed. They've had their reputations destroyed. Character assassinations. Um, I mean, and it's true. It, it's not something that is... Uh, now, does that still happen today, though? Or, I mean, because yeah, I understand 50, today, 60 yeah. years ago, because no, 50, 60 I'm years ago, today. I understand, but... It still no, happens. Yes, this is still happening. I mean, mm. there, there's, there's, you know, people who have come out in, you know, in, in the face of, of academia and said, wait a minute, why aren't we being, why aren't we having this discussion? And I, I'll give you a good example because I can say, you know, this is happening today. Right. Let me give you a good example. Um, this this isn't really in the realm of archaeology, but it touches in the it touches on it. It's in it's in the field of paleontology. Mm, okay. Let me let me let me give you a, a, a prime example of this. It's happened just just uh, years ago. Dr. Mary Schweitzer um, was a, a a scientist and still is, um, and um, she worked for um, Jack Horner. He's a very famous paleontologist. Jack Horner is um, uh, study dinosaurs and, and, and dinosaur bones. And, and so he's, he's very well known. And, and I've dug up a lot of dinosaurs in my time, um, at least 15 different dinosaurs. I've, I've been on many excavations, a couple of woolly mammoths and a big talosaur. Uh, I've directed two excavations, one in Montana, one in Colorado. Um, so I know about dinosaurs. I've dug them up out of the ground and it's hard work actually. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and um, Mary Schweitzer decided to slice open a, a, a bone, a dinosaur bone. And she wanted to, she wanted to know what was inside that dinosaur bone. And basically, you know, it, she, she took a very thin slice of this thing and she put it under solution and, 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 looked under under an electron microscope and what she realized was that there was still soft tissue in that bone there was huh. um, there was pliable tissue there was red blood cells and there was still elasticity to that oh, and uh, really? it, yeah and so uh, what does she do well, she did what any good scientist would do. She would she followed the scientific method, and right. you know you go through stages. You you know you predict the experiment, you repeat it, you observe it, you test it, and more importantly, you try to falsify the thing. And so she she repeated uh, the experiment, and she got the very similar results. And she repeated the experiment, and she repeated it, 
and she repeated it. I'm talking 20, 20 times at least and got the same result. Fresh, um, uh, pliable tissue. In other words, inside a 65 million year old dinosaur bone, it wasn't totally fossilized. Huh. There was still soft uh, tissue in there, and there was red blood cells that was still visible under electron huh. microscope. That's this amazing. is one example of something that the empirical level coming out and saying, okay, this, this is not totally fossilized. After 65 million years, it should be. <laughs> right. And the question is, why? And so when she came out with her results, it rocked the paleontology community. I mean, it rocked it, turned the boat upside down, right? And they're scratching their heads. They're saying, we, we don't know. We don't have a good answer for this. But, you know, it's going to change everything we know. And, and so she basically had a peer-reviewed published paper on the thing. And then they realized, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, um, because this is going to change really what we've been teaching. This is going to change the fact that maybe, maybe these dinosaurs didn't die the way we think they died. Maybe they're not 65 million years old. And if they're 65 huh. million years old, why aren't they totally fossilized? Why are we seeing fresh tissue red right. blood cells in this thing. And because of that, they put a lot of pressure on Dr. Schweitzer, a lot of pressure to pull um, and recant her research. Not just mm. not just her story, her research. That's and sad. because of this, they, they, they basically gave her an ultimatum. Um, you pull it, and, and we're not talking about this again, or... Um, you're done. And she held out as long as she could. In the end, she she recanted and she gave up the research on it. And it's it's it, it's 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 tucked away. It's gone. They're not doing it anymore. We thought, you know what? If that's true in one dinosaur bone, it's got to be true in another dinosaur bone somewhere. And so, while we were on the excavation in Montana. We called Jack Corner, and we said, look, you know, we, we, we know what you guys found over there, and, and we know you don't like the result, but look, let's, let's, let us offer you something. Let's do a double-blind study. Let's take our dinosaur bone in Montana, and you pick a dinosaur bone in your laboratory. We're going to do a double-blind study. We're going to see if we can match the results or if we get totally different results and maybe maybe we get something different but let's repeat the thing under a double blind study let's see what this goes you know let's see where this goes jack corner refused and well we said why why would you refuse you know to to just repeat the experiment double blind study objectively send it off and let's compare results wouldn't do it and we said, look, there's people who really want to see this done. And an offer was made, not by us, but by an independent third party, who said, look, we're going to offer you, and we're prepared to write you a $10,000 check for your research if you would do it and see what the results are, you know, what the results are going to be. He refused. So it tells me, that he's not worried about the money, obviously. He's scared about the results of the research. Right. And he didn't do it and wouldn't allow it to be done. Hmm. We went ahead and did our own experiment on our dinosaur bone and sent it off. And we came up with very similar results that Dr. Mary Schweitzer did. And that that dinosaur bone wasn't totally fossilized after you know, all these, you know, 65 millions of years, there was pliable tissue that was elastic in red blood cells. And you have to ask the question now, scientifically, you should ask, why are we seeing this? Because the results are there. The results isn't lying. The results are, are saying, hey, here's another independent source. 
but what are we going to do with this information? Unfortunately, the information got got squelched, and um, and now it's 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 not talked about. That's one example. There's there's many more examples of findings in archaeology, paleontology, geology um, that never get to the to the light of the public at all because it cuts against the grain of everything that we've ever been taught right. about life origins. And that, to them, um, I don't know if it's scary or if it's, if it's um, you know, taboo. I, I really don't understand why they won't allow that to come out, but, but they don't. So it takes archaeologists like myself and others in the field who are outside of that system – to raise the red flag and say, if you're not going to discuss it, if you're not going to go investigate it, if you're not going to look at it, if you're not willing to talk about it, we are. And that's what I do. It doesn't shock me, though, that stuff like that would happen. Um, it, it, you know, science has always had that issue, though, Aaron. Uh, look at what Galileo went through, you know, years and years and years ago. And he was like the the father of modern science, and, I mean, he didn't have it easy either. So uh, it doesn't shock me that, you know, all across the board, science is like that. It, it, you know, you would think for scientists who are supposed to be the smartest people on the planet, sometimes they really are kind of behind the curve when it comes to evolution evolution, and some of the these things, that, you know, the, the, these discoveries. Uh, but, you know, let's jump onto something that is a little bit more ufological. Has there been any cases within the UFO community of archaeologists finding stuff uh, that has been suppressed? Um, findings in the UFO community from the, an, an archaeological perspective. Any, anything you might know of? Um, not offhand. I, I would say that there is research going on um, uh, in in Peru and Bolivia that um, some suggest that there's archaeological research or um, artifacts suggesting that there's UFO interference um, or or um, uh, prior visitations or, or whatever in the past um, I think there's some some pretty intriguing evidence. I don't know that we can say for sure what the origin of all this is, if it's UFO intervention. You know, but in 2011, I wrote a, I co-authored a book called Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim. Yes. And um, um, I debuted that book on um, Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. And... Um, and out in Roswell, New Mexico in 2011, where I met uh, some of the greats, Stan, uh, Stan Freeman and Travis Walton and, and a number of others. And, um, you know, in that book, I really talk about um, the archaeology findings of a lot of the past and, and why they're very puzzling. And for me, as an archaeologist, why I would be interested in UFOs, well, is is a little bit of um, of kind of an interesting story for me. It, it all started for me uh, in 2008 with the Stephenville Lights, what I call the Stephenville Glen Rose sighting. We know it as the Stephenville Lights, more commonly. Right. And that hit. Uh, just near where I live in 2008, as a matter of fact, on that very night, I was driving um, uh, 20, 20 minutes prior to that sighting on that particular highway. Hmm. Um, now, I didn't see anything, but later, after I got to my destination, I heard reports about uh, that sighting, and um, it, it became somewhat of, of a intriguing thing for me because this was not just your you know your your average show saying no oh, y'all saw it and I, you know <laughs> you know we saw something Get a moon the shine. yeah <laughs> you know it, it wasn't that kind of report it right. was you know the police officer of Stephenville it mm -hmm. was the mayor of Stephenville it was the postmaster it was pretty credible witnesses right. here 
that was saying, hey, we saw something. Um, a pilot of 30 years, uh, Steve Allen, said, I saw something. And very credible witnesses. And that really led me on to this journey of what what is this thing about? Why was it near a nuclear plant in Glen Rose, Texas? And why was it being chased by F-16s out of Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas that night, who the U.S. Air Force for 10 days denied that they had any aircraft in that area, but 10 days later said, oh, you know, well, we did. We did have a training exercise going on out there. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we, um, we, you know, but we, we forgot to tell you, but, yeah, we did. Really, and, and it's interesting because at the time they released the um, – Freedom of Infor- through the Freedom of Information Act, the radar reports from Carswell Air Force Base, and uh, and we have those, and it shows F-16s chasing an unknown, unidentified flying object that's traveling. They estimate at least eighteen hundred miles an hour, and these jets can't even catch it. I mean, it's eluding them left and right, and I've seen the radar images. I've seen the thing, and the witnesses describe an object flying past them and then F-16s low and flying hard. Um, And Steve Allen has testified to that. uh, How much much do you think of this, uh, Aaron, though, is uh, actual extraterrestrial uh, crass, or how much of that do you think is our own back engineered crass, or just original stuff that we might have engineered ourselves? I don't think we would be chasing our own craft if it was going. At, number one, we couldn't go that fast. Not in turn right angles. There's no way you can't do that. It de- it was defying the laws of physics, for God's sakes. I mean, there's no there's no technology we have that can do that. Number one, a human couldn't survive that. That's why. That's well, why yeah, but that you're, th- you're not thinking outside the box. You were, you were talking about uh, a government that has uh, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars laundered into the black budget projects that it probably does have. Sure, yeah. Uh, who was not to say they've uncovered some form of freaky technology that well, really had no alien intervention, just uh, years and years of billions going into these programs and getting the right minds to create some of this stuff. Now, I do think, though, Aaron, that we have back-engineered some stuff. I do believe there have been recoveries of genuine UFOs, uh, alien aircrafts, or whatever you want to call them. I do believe that, but I, here's the thing. I don't think there are as many flying around as you know the the population will have you believe. Uh, while I do think some sightings are real, and usually, and actually what you said makes a lot of sense, the, the, you know, these credible witnesses, that's where I think it gets, you know, to the point where oh, those are the cases that I'm like, okay, that's more credible to me, when you have witnesses that you can look at and you're like, okay, this is a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer, people that, you know, wouldn't lie about this kind of stuff. Uh, those are credible cases, or a little bit more credible to me. Uh, but again, I, don't, I still have a hard time saying that it's always aliens. You know what well, I mean? we just don't know. I'm not saying we it's just don't know either. exactly. No, I'm just saying don't it's know. unidentified, and it was flying. I, now, right. I didn't see it, but but that event led me on to to search. What was that? And, and don't blame and, me. Yeah. And and why are people seeing the thing? And listen, I have to mm. tell you real quick. The reason it really prompted me in my interest is because when I was 17, uh, I saw something that I couldn't explain. I was with three of my high school buddies. It was I wasn't by myself. We were um, on a we were out for summer break. I was going into my senior year of high school, and it was about midnight. And we saw this red light dart across the sky. At first, it was floating, very slow, very low on the horizon. A red ball of light, no flashing lights, no nothing, no sound either. My friend Mark, who was standing right next to me, he was a year older than me. This was his last, um, uh, I think he was, a, uh, I think he was a grade older than me. At any rate, he was, he was an aspiring air force pilot. He was going to be, you know, he loved air airplanes, air force. He was going to the air force Academy. I mean, he knew everything there was to know about this stuff. And he said, that's not 
that's not a, a, an airplane. And I said, well, because I just dismissed it. He said, no, look, it doesn't have any flashing lights. It's going very slow. And there's no sound. And when he started pointing out the inconsistencies of it, then I took a double take and started to look at this thing. We called our other friends back, and we said, hey, look at this. And we all stood there, walked up to the fence on this pasture road, staring at this thing. And the thing took off like you wouldn't believe, all kinds of zigzag motions. I talk about this in the book that I wrote, Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim. And um, and it did something very odd after that. It uh, it, it faded um, it faded to black, <laughs> if I can use that. For, you <laughs> Shout know, outs to Jimmy, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> I did, uh, but that's what it did. It, it, it faded away. And it disappeared from view, and um, and so uh, we were questioning ourselves: Where did this thing go? What I mean, what did we just see? Where did it go? And then it came back, and it reappeared in the air, and then it did all kinds of crazy things again. And I got the wild idea out of the bunch, and um, you know, let's go chase it. Let's go. Let's get in the truck. Yeah, that didn't work out. That didn't work out too well for Travis. Let me tell you, that didn't work out too well for Travis Walton <laughs> going um, after the UFO. And and you know, and so so for me, we never got an answer for what that thing was. But um, but you know, I I think there's there's interesting things out there. We don't know, you know, a lot of how they did things. The ancients, we don't know what exactly happened back in those days. I can tell you I've traveled the world. I was in Peru back in January with L.A. Marzulli, and um, and we went into Bolivia. Uh, we filmed Watchers 8 down there. Uh, right. L.A. had me study those elongated skulls down there. Uh, that book is coming out, by the way, and my report's going to be in it on those skulls. It ought to be out in just weeks. But I well, give, can you, can you give us a tease? Uh, I don't want to give spoilers away. Well, obviously, I want the people to check out the report, but uh, give us a little teaser on the report. Well, you know, we went down there and studied the, those Paracas elongated skulls. Um, they're they're intriguing. They're very interesting. Um, scientifically, uh, we know culturally that they performed uh, cradle head morning. The right. Paracas culture did. The Incas right. didn't do it, but the Paracas culture, which is pre-Inca, did that. Right. We don't know why. Um, one of the theories is is that they were emulating something that they saw, hmm. which now would lend to the fact that if you believe in those 200 watcher angels that came down on Mount Hermon and intervened in the affairs of mankind, um, then that would tend to make sense. Because now we're seeing things in archaeology, we're seeing things um, in in culturally coming up through the ages that clearly show that there was some kind of intervention right. um, into mankind's affairs. Was this an outside agency? Some people say alien. I say fallen angels. Well, how do you make the distinction, though, Aaron, uh, from aliens and, and fallen angels? Well, uh, you know, this is something actually I've talked about on the show here where, I, uh, you know, I've mentioned that in the past, uh, hundreds of years ago, it's easy to mistake uh, aliens for demons, ghosts, goblins, angels, yeah. uh, because they didn't know the term alien or what aliens right. were. And it, the mere definition of uh, of angels or, or God, for example, uh, you know, God is not of this earth, right? Angels are not from this earth. So their mere definition of what they are is they're extraterrestrial in nature. Uh, now, how much of that is, you know, biblical and no, I'm glad otherworldly, you... or how much of it is it yeah. physical alien beings that we've just mistaken for these saints or, or deities? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There's a, there's a distinction that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, because the definition of alien has changed, I think, over the years. Um, when I say alien, I'm saying a foreign outside agency. I'm not saying alien as in extraterrestrial necessarily. Extraterrestrial means a terrestrial creature um, from a different planet or whatever, not from this earth. 
Right, I a, don't a creature outside of this terrestrial plane. Right. Anything, I don't yeah. think that they're terrestrial or extraterrestrial. I think they're spiritual. I think they're the fallen angels that was talked about in the book of Enoch. However, having said that, and I talk about all this in the book if you're interested, but look, having said that, those fallen watchers who were not extraterrestrial but spiritual in nature could transform themselves into physicality, and they could do it at will, and then they could go back. And I think that's what we're seeing in the UFO phenomenon because it's outside of our time domain. It's outside of our length, height, width, and time, which is the fourth dimension. Scientists and string theorists now uh, propose that there's at least ten dimensions. Four of those right. are knowable. I just talked about that. Six are not right. knowable. And that gets into Dr. Michio Kaku's stuff, which yes. is quantum you know, uh, <laughs> mechanics and physics, which I, I find very fascinating. But it, it I... I think they're able to do this, and I think that also explains the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, but here's, here's, here's the thing, though. If they're, if they're spiritual beings, if they're angels, if they're fallen angels, why would they need technology like UFOs? They don't. Spacecrafts. They, they don't, don't, right. They don't need it. What they're so doing, why though, fly is, around? why fly around in, in spacecrafts? I don't think that they're flying around in space, spacecrafts. I think that we're seeing a remnant of them breaking through into our time domain, and we're seeing the trails of that. Now, I think they can manifest physically when they want to, and they can manifest material things when they want to, i.e. crafts, something that we could recognize, something that we could um, we could we could um, um, Basically, we could we could identify, we could um, latch onto and say, "Hey, that's something that's recognizable to us." I don't think they have to do that. I think what they're doing is toying with us, in a way, because they're very elusive. It's not like, "Hey, we landed here, we are," and you know, there's no more deception. Everybody knows it's 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 here. I, take the Travis Walton case. I mean, I asked the man, I met with him, and I said, Travis, if you could go back to that time, and knowing what you know now, would you have ever gotten out of your pickup? And he told me no. Why? Now, I, I think he's changed his answer since then, <laughs> but, but he told me no. And he I told me the why. same thing, yeah. <laughs> because what Travis went through was so terrible – was so traumatic that it changed his life forever. And you never hear about people coming back and going, you know what, it's such a great experience. I'm going to schedule my next vacation around that. <laughs> you, don't have, well, I, you don't hear anyone saying that. You don't, actually. That's very true, except for one guy, my good friend Phil Hill. He loves taking that ride. And there may be, there may be another <laughs> one, you know, um, uh, uh, UFO Phil, Schreiber may be another one uh, that that <laughs> that really enjoys that, but you know, and I think they're they're the exceptions yeah. to the cases, but the majority of cases are very horrific. They're against their will. They're malevolent, and they're very very evil. See, my and, my thing though with uh, getting into the you know the spiritual aspect of where these beings could be, Aaron. Uh, it, you know, it really boggles my mind why then they would experiment sexually on people, why cattle mutilations happen, uh, crop circles, you know, if that's a legit thing or phenomenon. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of hoaxers in that as well. But, you know, you know, why all these extra things that happen within the ufology field if they're spiritual beings? Why toy with us? And they, see, none of that makes to me any sense. And even if they're spiritual beings, on the other side, wherever that other side is, they're physical on that side. Well, they're, that's their terrestrial plane, wherever their that is. their existing plane, sure. Right. Um, so why are they doing the, it? Yeah, it makes no I, sense to me. Well, you know, we try to answer that in the book. Um, in the end, listen, in the end, this is all gearing up for something big. Art Bell right. used to say the quickening. This yes. is gearing up yeah. for something. Tonight, uh, we're, we're having a blood moon tonight. 
I don't know if you know anything about the Blood Moons. I don't oh, really yeah, know yeah. how much stock to put into the Blood Moons, to be honest with you. But let me tell you, there's stuff going on, and if and if you don't recognize it, and I'm sure that your listeners do, that's why we have alternative media, we have alternative archaeologists, we have people that are out there yelling and screaming from their rooftops. Um, and Art Bell he started it for radio, mm-hmm. is, yes, he and did. he called it the quickening. Hey, look at Amy, it, something's coming, and 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 if you ask people that are are dealing within the the realms of this thing, no matter what angle they're looking at, they all come down to a common theme. Something's coming down the road, and it may not be good. And that's the thing that really bothers me is, you know what? Maybe we need to wake up and prepare for what's coming down the road because it may not be good. And and that, for me, that's at least personally uh, something that I worry about. Not worry, but I just, it's always in the back of my mind. What What is the thing that's coming? I think I know. <laughs> I think I know what's coming, but look, you have to you have to find that thing for yourself. I wrote it in the book just because I thought, you know what, no one's really approaching it from this particular angle, and so I think it I think it would be good. And and basically, it started out as a research thing for my own for my own self, uh, but no one really came out with that particular angle, and that's why the book really did well. Um, because it's a different perspective. You may not agree with it, and a lot right. of people, you know, have have other um, other views. That's okay. I'm just saying, you know what? I may be wrong, but I may be right on some of these things too. Well, you know, it's funny because you say that something is coming, and you know, it's true. Art Bell, def- he definitely said that that he believed there was a quickening happening, and the veil was dropping. Uh, were terms that he would use often, and uh, you know, it's funny because it, you could almost equate that to religious beliefs in the rapture. That you know, that rapture is coming, that the end is coming, uh, that Jesus is coming back to take us away. Or now, since you know, ufology and you, the extraterrestrials are so popular, now is the aliens are coming to save us. The aliens are going to intervene. The, you know, it, but it seems like it's always the same kind of story. Something is coming. Well, and and that's the common thread of the whole thing. Uh, right. Depending on your perspective and your religious point of view, if you hold one, uh, you may have a little bit different, you know, outtake on the thing. But look, I think they're all pointing to something, and um, I just think we need to be vigilant. I think we don't need to we don't need to take this thing with a grain of salt. I think we have to be very, very careful. Um, as an archaeologist, you know, I love and in, in going out and doing these things and, and you know, exposing the truth. Um, hmm. I think we have to, whatever you do, whether it's digging up stuff in the field as an archaeologist, whether it's, you know, investigating UFOs. Uh, Chase Kleski is a good friend of mine who went down to Peru with me. Um, and, you know, she she's a, she's at the top of her field. Um, I think whatever it is that you do, I think you need to be vigilant, but have your guard yeah. up. Uh, have your guard up, and that's all I'm saying, is we need to be very careful when we're mess- – don't mess around with stuff we don't understand, especially when it comes to these type of things that are well above us, well advanced in technology, well advanced in 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 knowledge. And I think that's how the ancients got a lot of their wisdom was through this forbidden knowledge that they got from these watchers. Can I prove it? No. But we see the evidence of it in archaeology. I mean, I was in Peru and Bolivia and, you know, we don't even know how they built a lot of these megalithic structures. I mean, I was mm-hmm. at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. I was at Puma Punca. I was at uh, Sacsayhuaman in Peru. I was at Machu Picchu. I was at Olinton Tambo. And these are huge structures, huge um, uh, stones, oblique angles, 12-sided stones. Um, insane. How do they do it? Don't know. As I mentioned earlier on the show, and I've talked about a couple of times, we're going to have Michael Heiser on the show pretty soon. And I'm super excited about having him on. I know you briefly met him, um, Aaron, and 
uh, you know, his work is very controversial, to say the least. And not, you know, just because of the stuff that he talks about and the stuff that he's, you know, gone on record as trying to debunk and, and putting out there. Uh, but he, de- he deals with other people that are controversial as well, like Zachariah Sitchin's work. I mean, his work is extremely controversial. Yeah. Uh, you know, what was your take meeting Michael Heiser and some of the stuff that he's worked on? Well, I met him very briefly at a conference I was speaking at. Um, um, he He's... He's got, you know, he's got some good work. I don't agree with everything, um, but but that's okay. Uh, his work on ancient aliens debunk, I found very interesting. Um, I was in, as I said earlier, I was down in Peru and Bolivia, you know, and and I was very familiar with um, with the ancient alien theory of of both of these places, uh, Tiwanaku, Pumapunka. And when I went in there, especially at Puma Punka, I'm looking for the seven, eight foot, you know, huge H blocks. Right. I'm looking for these things, and, and I'm not seeing them. And I'm thinking, where's the seven foot, eight foot H blocks? You know, where are these things at? And I'm looking, and I realize that they're not seven, eight feet tall. They're waist high. Hmm. They're 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 small. I mean, I, I was like, what? This is it? This is it? This is the H-Box? This is where the, where, George Hill's been lying to us. Where, come on, man. Where's the huge H-Box? And so TV gives you this huge perspective of these huge H-Box coming down. They were levitated, and they were all interlocking in place. And, you know, I looked at that personally, and I realized they're not huge. They're waist high. Um, they're inset cut, but they're not laser cut. I took a square with me. And I, I checked; they're not they're not all identical. Like they're they're in a factory, and they've all been laser cut, and they're all identical. They're not right. like that. They're they're all just a little bit individually unique, very similar. I would have to say they are very similar, but they're not identical. Similar. They're 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 close, but it doesn't mean that they're laser cut. And and look, I took some of that andesite stone. And, and, and it's, you know, it's not something that is impossible to do that with back, I think, for that time period. Now, how did they do it exactly? Don't know. Um, I think Dr. Heiser brings some good points. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, look, in science, you have to be, you have to be scientific and you have to say, okay, according to Ogman's razor principle, Right. What's the most simplest explanation for this? And when you go back to the most simplest explanation, knowing what we know about the culture and finding some of the things we found there, you have to, at least according to Dr. Heiser, say, maybe this isn't laser cut after all. Maybe there's a simpler explanation for this. I really like that idea because we tend to overlook the simple and go straight for the... Oh my God! Extraterrestrials. It's laser cut. <laughs> and you know, I didn't a, a, see that. A lot, a lot of that stuff, time. though. A lot of that stuff goes uh, comes from Eric Van Daniken's uh, books, and and uh, that's where a lot of these theories really come from, Aaron. Well, you know, look, my, I've never met uh, Eric Van Daniken. I, I know people who know him. Mm. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that he's. Uh, put out there. I do think he's made some valid points on some things and he definitely opened the door to you know talking about this. I right. I think that's I think that's commendable that that he did that. It doesn't mean I that I agree with it. But personally having been down there and researching this, it's uh you know, you realize in reality when you get there, it's not like you see on the TV. And it's a very simplistic site. Matter of fact, Puma Punka is a pretty small site mm-hmm. compared to Tiwanaku. And the other thing I thought was kind of fascinating was is that they're just a couple of miles apart from each other. Right. I didn't know that until I got there. And I was, hey, Puma Punka is just right down the road. Matter of fact, I walked from Puma Punka into town of Tiwanaku <laughs> from that site um, because there was no room on the bus for me. <laughs> and... um and so I just walked into town. And uh, so Puma Puka is a, relatively a small site, 
it's a nice place. I mean, when I say nice, it's not nice like here in North America. It's not, nice. Yeah, it's, it's not like the big city. Yeah, it's it, it, big it's, city. you know, you're in Bolivia, okay? It's uh, yeah. it, but it's a very neat country, uh, culturally rich. I loved it. I really did. I want to go back. Peru, the same thing. Culturally rich, lots of history. Um, it, it's very fascinating. I went all over the country. I stayed a month. And um, I really want to go back because you just can't learn it all in one trip. But look, I, you know, I went down there to study those elongated skulls. This report that I'm writing for L.A. Marzulli is going to be out uh, in his book very soon. It's, it's going to be called On the Trail of the Nephilim, Volume 2. And that's coming out very soon. Um, and then, um, of course, we filmed Watchers 8, which is uh, L.A.'s series on the Watchers. And uh, that's out now. Um, as a matter of fact, people have asked me to publish my journal on my Peru trip. Um, I recently did that with my um, um, Mount Ararat expedition last fall in eastern Turkey. Uh, people asked me to publish that journal, and I, I decided to do that. I originally wasn't going to, but I, I went ahead and did that. And the pre-order for that is up now at AaronJudkins.com. Uh, and people's asking me about the Peru Journal, so I thought, yeah, yeah, why not? I'm going to do that. So the Peru Journal is going to be coming out next, hopefully cool. by the end of the year. I'm not sure, but uh, if you go to AaronJudkins.com, uh, it'll be up on that website. And then I should have a link to uh, to the uh, to the book of On the Trail of the Nephilim, Volume Two, with with the report in it. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be at Laughlin, Nevada, in November. Um, 14th, uh, this uh, Back to the Future conference there, November 14th, 15th, and 16th of this year, 2014, Laughlin, Nevada. I'm going to be speaking on November 14th. Um, um, uh, it's going to be a great conference. A lot of a lot of great uh, people are going to be there, speakers, uh, including um, Chase Kleski and um, and George Norrie and uh, and and a host of others. Um, but if you're interested in the Back to the Future conference in Laughlin, Nevada, it's at the Aquarius Hotel. And um, just go to uh, my website, AaronJudkins.com, or you can go to StarWorksUSA.com, uh, StarWorksUSA.com, and register for that. Um, it ought to be uh, it ought to be a really interesting conference over there. I love that name, by the way, Back to the Future conference. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great name. I know. Uh, it, you know, it's funny because I, I it, going back to what we were talking about earlier uh, with the Nephilim. Uh, I do think there's more proof in biblical history or in biblical uh, artifacts and works uh, for possible intervention from aliens or otherworldly beings than uh, we've seen in Eric Fantanikin's books. Uh, a lot of the stuff I believe has been mis mislabeled and translated by him. But uh, you know, the Nephilim is an intriguing factor in this whole thing, uh, because that's literally taken from the Bible. Well, the Nephilim is something that I really wanted to write about also in, in the book called Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim. It, that, right. that book is up on the website at AaronJackson.com, but <clears throat> pardon me, but you know, oh, the boy. Nephilim is a very, um, a very intriguing factor into all this because they were the offspring of those fallen angels. Right. There's a lot of, literature in the ancient accounts about these Nephilim, or known as giants. And we know, at least through the ancient cultures, that they have a lot of story about mm -hmm. giants. Even the Native oh, Americans yeah. yep. have stories of giants. And it's very interesting that there's a whole link to all this, to back to that story. And I think that there's, there's a commonality between just like the commonality between the Aztecs and the Incas and the Egyptians and and the Mesopotamians, um, you know, in ancient Ur, you see pyramids. The very first pyramids were the step pyramids, not in right. Egypt, but right. in ancient Mesopotamia. Yep. And then you see them in South and Central America, and they're going back to the step pyramids again. And you have to ask yourself, why are they going back to step pyramids? And the answer is because they're they're performing human sacrifice on top of those things. 
And they're doing oh. something, they're taking it to the next level. The Aztecs took that whole thing to the next level, and they took you up there, man, and they cut your heart out while you were alive. I mean, these guys were brutal. No kidding. They were like the Scythians, man. The Scythians were brutal, too. Um, you know, a lot of these guys in the ancient past, you know, uh, they weren't they were not kind. If if yeah, they weren't cooking kind, cutter civilizations. <laughs> yeah, you would uh, you would suffer terribly. And, and and of course, the Aztecs. We know mm-hmm. that you know they would cut your heart out and sacrifice yep. you and throw you down. That's not movie stuff. That's reality. Reality, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and we know that from an archaeological point of view. Just a, recently, they found a mass grave under one of those, uh, or near nearby, I should say, one of the step pyramids. We know that's all true. Uh, we know culturally that they practiced that. They, the, the, the thing we have to ask ourselves is why? Why would they do that? It's because they worshipped a deity called Quetzalcoatl, and Quetzalcoatl promised them forbidden knowledges and the mathematics and sciences, if yet they would only perform human sacrifice and worship worship that deity that's not that's not Aaron's theory that's written in the Aztecs you know literature that's yeah. that's written in their archives that is that is a known fact so they took it to the next level and they were doing this thing and and we so we see that yes that there's a commonality in giants as well throughout the cultures even in Native Americas the Paiutes the Cherokees the Choctaws uh, etc and we know that at Lovelock Cave in Nevada, um, the Paiutes just uh, not too long ago said there were giants in those caves. And you know what? They discovered uh, the, 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 the skeletons of these things and the, and the skulls in these caves. And I have to tell you that for some reason, that didn't get collected by the Smithsonian and we had um, we've got pictures of those skulls, and and they found pestles at the entrance of the cave. A pestle is a, a big stone a stone rock that they used to grind, uh, you know, uh, corn or maize or whatever, and they yeah, mesquite beans, and they would they would use it to crush and grind with. Okay, it's a stone, and they found two pestles towards the mouth of the cave. One weighed twenty five pounds. Wow. And the other one weighed 40 pounds. One pestle weighed 25 pounds, the other weighed 40. Now, you have to say, why, who, what normal person could pick up a 25-pound pestle? Some, some lady that, you know, uh, Native American who's, who's, you know, making the meal for the day, and she's going to use a 25-pound pestle and a 40? No. <laughs> that makes no sense. These yeah. were giants, and the Paiutes said that they were giants, and they were mm. cannibalistic. And so we've done a lot of research on that, too, which is very interesting, that, yes, I think it ties back into the Nephilim. We talk about it um, um, in Watcher's Aid. We talk about it in, in the book that I wrote. It, 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 you know, that's, that's a plausible theory. Were they emulating, were the Paracas culture emulating something they saw? From the gods, yeah. So it very, does, very it, interesting. It makes perfect sense. Uh, in, in fact, um, we saw something like this in the movie Star Trek Into Darkness, uh, where it starts off in planet Nibiru, the very beginning, and the natives see the starship at the uh, end of the very first uh, scene, and then they start drawing. So, you know, these old cultures would emulate whatever they would see. That is actually a factual thing uh, that they showed in that movie. This is why the Prime Directive would exist. Yeah, we don't know what, you know, what they were doing. We can't really prove it, but you know, the the theory is, one of the theories is, is that they were emulating something they saw. It was because of, uh, you know, it was royalty or showmanship of power uh, or or it, it could be for aesthetics, for beauty. We don't really know, but, you know, at this point it's a working theory. I think it's plausible. Um, uh, so we just don't know. Those skulls are very interesting, I have to say. That is that is very interesting stuff. But what what is the end agenda, though? I mean, uh, you know, the Nephilim agenda. What is their end agenda? What's the end game? For to the thwart Nephilim? mankind. The end game is to thwart mankind and to ultimately deceive mankind. And, um, and they have very alternative motives and means to do so. The, the, the tool is deception. 
and the goal is destruction. And I personally think that that's what they are doing, not not just to not just to mankind, to the to everyone, to 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 the earth. Uh, this, this is this is this is going bad. And look, when full disclosure happens, and I I think it will. Um, these guys aren't playing by the rules because they don't have to. They're outside of the rules. They're outside of our system. They're outside of everything we've known, and um, and they're going to be powerful, powerful beings. I think we have to be ready and vigilant, not only physically. I think you have to prepare yourself um, spiritually as well. Uh, but, and that's but, part of the. Yeah, but, but what defense could we really take against a superior race of beings or angels or whatever these things are? I mean, how could we possibly defend, defend ourselves? Uh, you don't accept their message. You don't accept what they're telling you because remember, they don't play by the rules. They use deception as a tool, and in the end, um, they they have their way. Deception is always. Always a tool they use in, in in a lot of the abduction cases. We don't talk about abduction cases in the book, but I do. We do talk about one case, um, and and look, deception is always a tool that they use. Or if they don't use deception, they just take you by force and against your will. That's right. why I say you have to be not only physically prepared. Yes, we need to be physically prepared for what's coming down the pike, but you know you have to be. Um, prepared spiritually. We are spiritual beings. Now, as an archaeologist and scientist, he's like, oh, how can you say that? You don't. You know, but you know what? Um, <laughs> I think um, it's it's uh, it's it's something that you have to know for yourself. Um, but there's there's a lot of evidence that people are not only physical, but we're spiritual beings as well, and we have a soul, which is comprised of our uh, comprised of our mind our will, and our emotions. And when you throw all that together, that makes us. That make, makes who we are. And the ancients even thought so. After we died, this isn't it. Why do you think the Egyptians buried you with everything that you ever had and killed all your servants? And, and you know, why do you think that they performed uh, very complex um, um, ceremonies? Mm -hmm. uh, not just the Egyptians, but others as well. And they did that because they believed in an afterlife. They believed that yep. this was not Definitely. the end, that yep. this was only the beginning. And um, and I have to agree, this journey in life is only the beginning. It's not the end. But what we do now determines our destiny and eternity. And I think that's very important um, for what we do now, how we live now, what we do with this gifted life. Look, I have to tell you, I wasn't going to say this. But look, I just lost some buddies in a helicopter crash, and I had to go out there and rescue them, my own crew. I had to pull my buddies out of a burning helicopter three nights ago. Oh and it really hits home because you realize how short this life is. Mm -hmm. And you have, you have to be ready. And, you know, bad things happen to good people. And I have to tell you, it hurts. It hurts because those were my friends in that helicopter. And and I got thrusted into a situation where, you know, my God, I'm pulling my own crew out. And, um, and the reason I say that is to say this. You have to be ready. Life is short. Don't live life um, the way that you're not supposed to live. Live it to your fullest. And and I think, yeah, I think if you know that you're doing what you're supposed to do, do it until you know what, until until you're gone. That's what that's what we're supposed to do. Don't live life haphazardly. Don't live it on the couch. Get up and do something. And you know, and it really, for me, a long time ago, I decided for me that I'm not going to, if I reach to an old age. And, and I'm talking to my grandchildren. I decided this. I am not going to tell them, I wish I would have done this in my life. I wish I would have gone to eastern Turkey and actually climbed Mount Ararat 
and went on that expedition. I wish I would have gone to Peru. I wish I would have gone to these sites and studied. I wish I would have done this. I regret this. And I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, you know what? I did the hard thing. I got up and I went. I got up and I went on this expedition. I did the hard thing. I did the things that no one else was doing. I was passionate about my thing. I didn't stay on the couch, and I didn't live life with regret. And I think for me, you know what? That propelled me to go say, you know what? It's never too late to pursue your passion. I was in the medical field, and I still am. And that's one of those hats I was wearing the other night uh, when I pulled my buddies out of that helicopter crash, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Um, they landed, they crashed a block behind our base. Terrible thing. Terrible. Yeah. What? When you um, go through something like that, it really does put into perspective, and like you said, how short life is. But uh, not only that, I mean, it puts a lot of other things into perspective, uh, how much time we waste on meaningless things instead of spending it with people we care about and people that love us back and, and doing, you know, the right things in life. Uh, but, and you know, that's really what life is all about is, you know, connecting with human beings and, and loving each other. But uh, sadly, we don't do enough of that. It's and, more you know, hatred. Do, doing that, and you know what? I came home, I hugged my family, mm. and, and I do anyway. But you know what? It just gives a little bit newer meaning on life. I bet, yeah, but you hugged them a little extra tighter. You do, maybe. you do. And, yeah. But you know what? It's about finding the truth. And 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 once you come to the knowledge of the truth, then you can live your life freely. You can live your life passionately. See, it's one thing to be always searching for the truth, but it's another thing to never find it. And and um, I think there's a big difference in searching for the truth mm. and finding the truth. And um, but look, you have to be able to go and search. If you don't, if you don't, I agree. then then um, then you are, I think, wasting time. For me, um, that's why I like going and and researching these things, doing these things that I do. I, and I realize and I recognize that not everybody can go do that. Um, <laughs> and I'm very blessed to be able to go and and do a lot of these things. Um, and it's been a lot of fun because I I bring it back to the listeners. I bring it back to the people, and I say. Here's the next thing. Here's what's going on. And I lay it out on the table. And I really don't say, here it is. This is what you should believe. I say, here it is. Make up your own mind. And it's okay to disagree. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. You know what? Here it is. Let's talk about it. You want to disagree? Fine. I'm just going to lay it out there. And I think that's what's great about it. Um, by the way, the film's coming out. Um, hopefully, this winter, Finding Noah, if you go to FindingNoah.com, it's a theatrical documentary that uh, documents our journey to eastern Turkey, Mount Ararat, in search of Noah's Ark. Uh, that's cool. coming out this winter. Uh, and look, I really need some help from your listeners. So tomorrow I'm going to be on with the network uh, execs for the History Channel, and they're going to be looking at doing a show uh, with me on uh, biblical archaeology. So if you're interested in seeing Maverick, old Mav here, Going on the History Channel on a new show, I really need your input. Go to AaronJudkins.com, and uh, on the bottom left of the screen, there, it'll say poll, and I really need you to put in your your honest uh, opinion on that poll. I need you to vote because they're going to be looking at this in the morning. So please go on to AaronJudkins.com, go to the poll, vote, and then go to Facebook to Man vs. Archaeology um, and uh, put in your comment. Yes, we want to see a show. And uh, comments, suggestions are welcome. This thing is going to happen in the morning. So your suggestions, your vote on the poll will count tonight up until uh, 11 a.m. Central Time in the morning. And uh, your input is, um, is very valued and very appreciated. And so thanks for doing that. Very cool. Hopefully everybody listening in can go over there and, uh, and vote. Aaron, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, my friend. We have to have you back on soon so we can continue talking because it's fascinating talking to you and, and to people like you that do the work you do. You are like a real-life Indiana Jones. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, you it's, really are. It's you really are. It's a, it's a lot of fun to, to, to be able to go do that. I, I really appreciate the, <laughs> the comment. And thanks, guys, for uh, for following me and, and my work. I, I really love all you guys. And uh, 
thanks for your show. It's been great uh, being your guest. It's been great having you on. And, and don't evade us like the president, like you, we're doing. <laughs> I promise. I come promise back on I'll soon. come back on. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's been a blast having Aaron on here. And uh, thank you all for listening in to Skywatchers Radio. Uh, for Keith Rowland, our webmaster, for my absentee co host, Alan Weiler, who. Uh, unfortunately had his headset crushed by the TSA. I'm not even kidding about that, by the way. We'll talk about that next week on the show. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for listening in, and it's been a blast. We're going to be back next week with a huge guest. It's going to be a lot of fun the next uh, few months. Travis Walton coming up, Michael Heiser coming up, uh, Stephen Bassett coming up, Stanton Freeman coming up. It just gets bigger and bigger and better and better right here on Dark Matter Radio Network. Keep listening. A lot of great shows coming up on both networks both PSN and Dark Matter Radio Network. Good night, everybody. Take care and keep looking up to the skies. Everybody, welcome back to Sky Watchers Radio on Dark Matter Radio Network and, of course, PSN Radio. And I want to ask everybody to please have a nice sit down right now. If you're standing up, if you're running around, sit down, turn the radio up, listen in. We're going to have a lot of fun with our guest, Mr. Aaron Judkins, aka Maverick. He's an author, explorer, and an archaeologist. From Texas. Don't mess with Texas. He has a passion for searching for the truth about the mysteries of the past and exposing forbidden history. Aaron, this is way long overdue, but welcome to Sky Watchers Radio, my friend. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. It, you're right. It is way overdue. <laughs> and if, the, if your audience only knew how overdue it is, maybe we should tell them. If they had an inkling or an idea of how long I've been trying to have you on this show, it would probably drive a lot of them to send you hate mail. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we no. got a lot of defensive uh, fans of this show, Aaron. You just don't know. We call them the, the Squash Nuts, by the way. That's the name of our group, Squash Nuts. Love you guys. They get defensive, so I don't want to have them send you any hate mail. But this man right here has been eluding us like the President of the United States. But it is so much fun <laughs> to finally have you on the show. I'm so glad to be on with you uh, on the show. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite odd that my schedule has been so, uh, so erratic over the last six months, you know, at 16, I'm looking for the nearest stick. I'm digging this thing out, you know. <laughs> this, this thing's going home with me. And um, my friend said, no, we should leave it. We should go tell my dad. And so, in hindsight, that was great wisdom. Mm, um, and uh, and so we did. I, I ended up dropping my stick and, you know, retreated in, in defeat <laughs> um, <laughs> because I wanted that, that skull. But turns out, that was a very important find. Later, the archaeologist uh, from the university came out and documented a whole new find they didn't know was there, and it allowed the Native Americans to come huh. out and um, and and basically uh, confirm the site. And then, you know, of course, uh, they were able to to make the final decision on what happened to it, and they and uh, and you know they 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 gained a lot of important knowledge from that site. But they left the human bones where they were, and that's exactly what you know what they did, and that was the right, right. thing to do. Yeah. So, um, and I didn't know the end of that story for a long time uh, later on in life, but um, but that led into a lot of um, a lot of searching about what the mysteries of the past are, and when I began to go into the field and study formally and academically in archaeology, and then went out in the field. I realized that there was a lot of 
um, evidence, a lot of empirical evidence that wasn't matching up to what I had been taught. And that really uh, led me to question why had I never heard about some of these things? Why was it that I was learning about this for the first time in the basements uh, and you know of artifacts and and you know people's homes and hey come over here we found something over here check this out or have you heard about this you know hey I've got something have you read about this and I'm thinking no I haven't feel was something that kind of was my bread and butter it always provided me you know the opportunity to kind of self fund myself and go out and do the things that I really was passionate about and that was history and archaeology. And uh, I really give my grandparents credit for that because they were old rock hounds. And, and, you know, I really got an appreciation for just going out and looking for rocks. And, and uh, that led into arrowheads. And, and, you know, so I had an early interest in my life about these things. And, uh, you know, when I, was, when I was about 16, I was out. Uh, with a friend of mine, we was on uh, a large ranch in the uh, Texas Panhandle, and there was a huge cliff, and there was a kind of a dry stream bed, and we were walking through there, and and I saw this huge bone laying on the ground. I ran over to it, and I picked it up, and it was huge, and I said, look at this bone. I pulled it out of the sand, and um, the person that was with me said, "That I think that's a bison bone. I said, what? A buffalo? Are you saying buffalo bone? She, and 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 the the thing was a huge buffalo bone. What we know is a is a bison bone. And my friend said, "Yeah, my dad, who was a foreman on that ranch, a cowboy foreman, said this is a, a cliff where the Indians used to run off the buffalo, and then they would, you know, they would, you know, uh, slaughter them, and you know, they would use them to survive." For, right. obviously for meat and for tool making and they used everything on that thing but here was yeah. here was a bone and I pulled this bone up and I was looking at it and I turned around and sticking out of the cliff was an occipital part of a skull the occipital oh, wow. part is the back part of your skull and it was a human skull and I immediately dropped the bison femur that was in my hands <laughs> and I'm staring at this and I said look at this thing this is this is a skull. It's a human skull. And so I, was, um, and every time we try to sync our schedules up, it just doesn't work out. And um, and I've got a very narrow window in my schedule these days. My um, area. And and it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, and it really bothered me because I had the last time I talked to you, I had to tell you, I said, I am not, I'm not doing this on purpose. I promise. I promise. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, it's really great great to be on this show tonight with you. And some of you listening might recognize the voice. You, of course, are a guest radio host for Epic Voyages Radio on uh, Inception Radio and, of course, uh, plays here on Dark Matter Radio Network. That's right. It uh, plays right here on Dark Matter on Friday nights. Uh, Epic Voyages Radio, um, Friday nights on Dark Matter Radio Network. And, you know, it's been a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Um, I don't do radio full time. I, I do it, as you said, as a as a guest host. I rotate through the uh, through that schedule about once a month. I go on the program, but I absolutely love it. It is so much fun. I get to do what you guys do all the time, mm. and um, I really have a blast doing it. It's it's a lot of fun, and I'm so glad for Keith um, for having us on the Dark Matter Radio Network, and. Um, you know, the audience has been uh, fantastic, mm -hmm. and, and the listeners uh, have been very responsive uh, to the show, and I know to your show as well. And so I'm glad to, you know, get out and, um, and, and finally get on uh, your program uh, tonight with you. So, so what, a, what an honor. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, one thing I definitely wanted to bring up is uh, your research in biblical uh, archaeology, which is uh, always something fascinating to me. And um, and we're going to talk about, you know, of course, ufology. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, folks. We're going to touch on ufology a lot. Uh, but I want to first, uh, you know, go into your background a little bit. And so for the, for the listeners who are not too familiar with your history, uh, give a brief description of what you've done in the past besides Epic Voyages. Great show, by the way. 
Oh, well, thanks. Um, you know, wow, I, I wear so many hats yes, you in, do. in my life. <laughs> uh, you know, when people ask me what I do, I have to tell them, you know, what day is it? Because it depends on what day it is, is what I'm doing. Um, uh, you know, basically, I I started out with a real passion for just for history and archaeology and learning. And um, um, and I just love to go to museums. I'd love to, to just learn everything I could about ancient civilizations, uh, Near Eastern archaeology, biblical archaeology. And I just, you know, the Native Americans here, America Southwest, I love it all. I mean, I do. I, I, I'll study it all. I don't know it all, but I love to study it all. <laughs> And, um, and, and because of that, that, you know, that led me to schedule my vacations around going to museums and going out, Mm. you know, to sites and, and things that, you know, um, were just a lot of learning fun, uh, on, on site, not from a book, although I love books. I, I, I do read quite a bit. I've probably read a thousand books in my life so far, and I've got um, a library full of books in my office. Um, but it's a different thing to go out into the field or just to go out and learn about those things. And and so for me, that that was just a tremendous thing to go do, but it was very limited for me. Um, and then my life kind of took a direction where I pursued a different field in the medical field for for many years, um, and currently still do, um, and that's why I say I wear many hats uh, because I do so many different things. Um, but the the medical 